Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Sappington. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a staff psychologist at the Loyola University Maryland Counseling Center. Each semester, we develop public health campaigns for the campus community focused on a specific topic. As part of this semester's campaign focused on grief and loss, we'd like to briefly share some information about the experience of grief and some resources. Please explore our website and Instagram to learn more. Grief can be defined in a number of different ways, but one simple way of understanding it is that it is an experience that can occur after loss. Both loss and grief can take many forms, whether it's the death of a loved one, either human beings or pets, the loss of our good health, the loss of a job or financial security, changes in our identities or moving to a different place or starting a new chapter, the end of a relationship, or failing to reach or even reaching a dream or a goal. In this video, we'll focus mainly on grief related to loss due to death. It's important to note that grief can include thoughts, feelings, and physical or physical physiological reactions, and that it differs for everyone depending on our cultural identities, our values, our beliefs, how we relate to our emotions, our prior experiences with grief, the cause of a death or how we learn about it, or the nature of our relationship to the person or experience that we lost. Of the many different forms that grief can take, one that is important to highlight is disenfranchised grief, which is grief that can often feel invisible or that carries a social stigma. Examples of this can include losing someone to suicide or an overdose, miscarriages, or the death of a pet. In the following slides, we wanna highlight some of the common ways to understand the grief process. Before doing so, it is again important to note how much grief and coping with grief is shaped by our cultural communities, our norms, and our beliefs. And so the information that follows may not fit all experiences. One of the most popular ways that people talk about grief is through the five stages developed by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. These stages include denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. While each of these can be part of the grieving process, many do not know that Dr. Kubler-Ross's work emerged from her experience working with terminally ill patients who were grappling with their own impending death. There are also limitations to the five-stage model. These include the fact that we rarely, if ever, experience grief in a linear way and some experiences of grief may not include any of these stages. For these reasons, it can be helpful to think about the five stages as possible states that we might encounter during the grieving process. Another way of understanding grief is thinking about what healing can look like over time. We often hear people talking about wanting to move past their grief or move beyond it but what really happens is that we move forward with it. After a loss, grief can feel all consuming in our lives. What many of us expect or even hope to happen is that grief will eventually get smaller. But a different way of understanding this is that grief does remain painful, but our lives grow around it as we find new ways of healing, growing, and connecting with others. A metaphor for this can be tree roots that grow around a boulder into the ground. Lastly, it is common for a grieving person to experience feelings of guilt in moments when they are quote unquote not grieving or even thinking about their loss. Times when we are distracted or busy or engaged in something or even laughing, it can be easy to feel like we aren't grieving if we're not feeling sad or angry. However, all of this, including times of joy, these are parts of grief, and our grieving process can include a balance between the two. The dual process model of grieving emphasizes the importance of bouncing back and forth between paying attention to the pain of grief or loss-oriented feelings and being distracted from or even avoiding that pain or restoration-oriented feelings. It is very important to again name that grief is a deeply personal experience. 
while these and other ways of thinking about grief may help some of us understand what we're going through, the full pain of grief can't be easily summarized into a theory or model. It can even be common to feel like these are an insult to the actual experience of what our grief can feel like. A few other things to consider. First, grief can include times when we aren't quote unquote grieving. These moments do not mean that we love someone any less or that, that our grief is any less painful or important. Grief has no timeline, ideal pace, or endpoint. It is a journey that others do not define for us, but it is also one that we do not have to take alone. Grief can change us. It's important to give ourselves permission to feel all parts of grief, including ones that don't fit what we think grief should look like. Journaling, music, and other forms of art can be ways that we process our grief, as can reaching out to family and friends and asking them for what we need, whether that be advice, distraction, or just finding someone to sit with us in silence. Considering to, consider reaching out to a counselor, counselor or joining a grief support group. Also think about rituals or way, ways that you might wanna honor the loss. Lastly, when supporting others who are grieving, don't try to fix it or make it better. Just be there and listen. Grief can be incredibly painful. It is also a universal part of the human experience. Please explore more of the Counseling Center's website and resources on coping with grief or helping others who are grieving. Please also reach out to us if you or anyone else needs support by visiting the front desk in the Humanities Building 150 between Monday and Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m or by calling us at 410-617-2273 or 410-617-5530 after hours or on the weekends. Take care.